I'm really loving these cooler days in the garden. Now, this week we're taking a little break from our regular Gardening Australia program. But don't worry, we know you need your weekly dose. So we've dug up some of your favourite gardens and gardeners from the last few years. Here's what's in store. I'm visiting a farm that isn't about producing food. Here, they grow dozens of different plant types for their use in cosmetics. And what's more, they're all grown organically. Jerry's taking the high road. One built specifically for some very special commuters, the wildlife. And Millie catches up with a very clever gardener who's made the most of her inner city space. Up until today, I didn't realise that Ballarat was Victoria's third largest city. Sorry, Bendigo, just pipped at the post. But among other things, it's also famous for the 1854 Eureka Rebellion. And how fitting that barely three kilometres from the site of the rebellion, another revolution is taking place. Not in the gold fields, but in a humble laneway. It's all about growing veggies and sharing with the community. And it goes by the hashtag, food is free. To understand how it works in its simplest form, let's say I had a great harvest at home. I can't possibly eat it all myself. So on my way to work, I head to the laneway and drop okay. it off. Meanwhile, another me, who doesn't have his own veggie patch, and needs some nice fresh veg, wanders down the laneway and takes enough for a meal. What a nice thing to be able to do. Oh. There. Meet the person in the vanguard of this food revolution gardener, community activator, and all-round great person, Lou Ridsdale. So how did it begin for you? Well, it was sort of brought about from a place of sadness. Uh, my mum passed away and I started gardening way too much. And it was a source of healing for myself. So once I'd sort of run out of friends and family to pass the food on to, and just thought it'd be a really good thing to open it up outside my laneway so that people can just come and grab what they want and participate and be part of it as well. So the first few months, obviously, people thought it was a bit of a crazy notion and that, you know, people are always suspicious of something that's free. And people would walk past the laneway and think it was a garage sale or that they were being pranked and that, you know, people thought that they might be on security cameras and why would people offer something for free? Then spontaneously someone left a piece of parsley with a note saying you may need this. And that's where I knew that once someone had reciprocated that um, the community had really gravitated towards it and then it just went great guns from there. And four years later, 100 people a day walked down our laneway, so it's incredible. This table here really is the central beating heart of Food is Free, isn't it? It is. It's where the magic happens. And this is where people drop off their spare produce that's homegrown and people take from this table. And how much of this produce here is actually from your garden? A little bit of it. Um, when it first started up, of course, I dropped a lot of the, my own produce here. But to be honest, I'd say at least 90% of it is from our community donated. So it's incredible. This is my favourite part of the whole um, laneway because I love this sound. The opening of the till box says to me that people are really thinking about the future and grow for free. It's really easy. We have a chart of what to grow in each season and it's all educational. People can come and get pots to, to grow their seedlings into. Yep. Oh, it's oh. all about encouraging people to do, do it themselves. These days, the project's really well established but in its infancy, it had to be rescued from the brink of disaster. I rent my house, so just after about six months of actually running the laneway and it had got a lot of traction and the city of Ballarat was behind the project and everything was just tracking so very nicely and then the, my landlady put the house up for sale. So I was fairly stressed at the time and wasn't sure of the future of Food is Free and an amazing uh, local businesswoman 
bought the house to secure the future and I've got the house for as long as I, I want and she's just an incredible woman. Um, you know, that's a deep level of, um, you know, giving. It's, it's one thing to, you know, drop off food to a laneway, but it's another thing to actually buy a, a house to keep the future going. What an incredibly generous offer to, to keep you afloat when you almost lost it all. Amazing. I mean, it was such a brilliant gesture, such a generous gesture. And, you know, it gave us that sense of permanency then, and it gave us that impetus to then take over the green space across the road, which was offered from the council. So we're really lucky. And I mean, look at it, it's so close. Like... Perfect. <laughs> yeah. <The> stone story. <laughs> about 30 seconds. The Foodies Free right. Green Space opened a year ago after a team of volunteers had transformed an unused section of a footy oval into a thriving community green hub, growing amazing produce all year round. There's so many different styles of community gardens around the country. What is it that you're trying to achieve with this space here? Well, we thought we'd do community gardening with a bit of a twist, and we recognise that there's some members of our community who can't afford a gardening plot like most community gardens. And so we opened this up to marginalised and at-risk persons in our community and they can come down here and garden with us, gain some skills, grow some food for themselves or take it to the laneway. And, you know, it's much more impactful if we do it that way. It's the best thing I've ever done in my life, easily. Keen composter wants to know if they can compost an old cotton shirt. Well, yes, you can. I've done it. I've even composted old cotton undies. But what I found, not surprisingly, is the elastic didn't break down. So you have to throw that bit out. Any natural fibre will break down. And in a good composting environment, it can happen within a couple of months. So give it a shot. What does sugar bag taste like? Well, forget ordinary honey. This is totally different. It's a complex flavour, it's quite runny, and it has a distinctive tang of citrus. You don't get much from a hive. These little bees work really hard, but only in a good year will I get some honey from them, and maybe about one litre from a hive like this. So it's not very productive. But having them in the garden is an absolute joy. I love watching them work, and the honey, really, well, that is just the cherry on top of all the pollination work they do for me and my food garden. Are there any native plants that you can grow indoors? Yes, there are. There are lots. Perhaps the maidenhair fern that you've had in your bathroom for a while. That's a beautiful little native that you can grow indoors. Just like many of our native ferns, you'll find them on the rainforest floor. Things like the bird's nest fern, perfect for indoors. Some of our native figs, spectacular indoor species. And just like outside, it's about finding the right plant in the right position. So experiment and have a go. You know, here at Gardening Australia, we firmly believe that plants can do almost anything. They feed us, they clothe us, and for centuries, they've been used to heal and nurture us. To say that Sophie was in her element filming this next story is an understatement. I'm a lover of plant scents and these roses are grown specifically for their perfume. It's just one of dozens of types of plants grown here, especially for use in beauty products. This property is only 20 minutes down the road from my place in the Adelaide Hills. This region was specially chosen for producing botanical essences. Our uh, aim was then to find a property which was as unpolluted as possible. Ulrika Klein is co-founder of the Jolique Company. What was right in South Australia as well was the climate, mm. because to grow herbs, and roses especially, you need this dry heat. So that, together with unpolluted mm. soils, that did bring us to the Adelaide Hills. So here we've got this beautiful display of roses, mm -hmm. heavily scented, and chamomile growing next to them. Now, both of these plants have really important herbal properties, don't they? They do. Roses, petals and rose essential oils are very soothing and healing and balancing. And they go really well with chamomile, because chamomile 
its main property, it's soothing and calming. Mm. And I just really love both these herbs together. Wow, and you've got lavenders there, again, full of essential oils, wonderful properties. Yes, and lavender, I think it's the most calming of all the herbs we grow. At a day's end, lavender essential oil in a foot bath or even a compress sort of brings this peaceful stillness to me and it's really wonderful if you have very active children. And here we've got elderflower, which I just love. I have a hedge of it and we use it to make cordial and when mm -hmm. the kids grow, I'll make wine and champagne. You know, when you look at these beautiful, almost snowflake-like flowers, mm -hmm. just these white, very often you have in herbs, we call it signature, that when you look at the herb really closely, you almost can sense a little bit the property of the herbs. That's mm -hmm. part of the old herbal knowledge. And here we have lemon verbenas. Just smell it. It's just so stimulating. Mm. It's just lemon scent and it's really easy to grow. Mm. And I think it's just absolutely beautiful. I so just, I use it for teas. It's gorgeous. But it. it's good on your skin too. It is, yeah, for body washes. It's mm. calming and stimulating. And some herbs have these both properties, which I find absolutely amazing. And here we have marshmallow, marshmallow root contains a lot of mucilage. And mucilage, that's this gel-like property, which is, gives a lot of moisture back to our skin. It protects it, mm -hmm. protects the moisture in it. Mm. And just when you just um, have the wood which are dry, put it in water. Just put a little bit of the mucilage on your face, a little bit like aloe vera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. And it's okay. really beautiful. Yeah. And of course, echinacea, which is used not only for its flowers but its root. It, echinacea is the immune system stimulator. And I just look how beautiful the flowers are. And we have fields of echinacea, which we grow. Yes, that's right, we use the heads but mainly the roots as well. And So is it sort of a two-year process where the first year you harvest the flowers, second year you harvest the whole plant to get the roots? That's exactly right. It needs to be over two years, definitely, so mm -hmm. that the uh, plants can actually multiply naturally. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Sophie will be back later to explore how these plants with special skincare properties are grown en masse and completely organically. You can grow just about anything anywhere, but when it comes to keeping your veggie patch healthy, a little bit of planning can help prevent problems. One of the cornerstones of success is crop rotation. And Tino's keen to show you just how simple it can be. It's been a long productive season here at The Patch with nice warm days and warm nights. We've been harvesting bucket loads of delicious organic food. So it's a good time to take stock of what's in the ground, what's finishing up, and the crops that have been through in the past, so you can better plan what needs to go in next. And that's where crop rotation comes in. I've set up this area at the corner of the patch to show you how it works. I've selected a four bed rotation system, but you can go for less or more depending on your site and your needs. Put simply, crop rotation is about splitting your crops up into different groups depending on what nutrients they draw out of the soil and what pests and diseases attack them. I've divided this area up into four groups. Roots, fruit, leaves and legumes but you can tailor one that works for you. For me, it's as simple as not putting the same plant in the same soil season after season. First up, my root bed. I'm gonna put mainly carrots, but I'm gonna get a cheeky little crop of potatoes in there as well. If you're starting out on new soil, both of these crops can be really good. Potatoes for breaking up clay soil and your tap roots like your carrots and your parsnips for drawing nutrient that's hidden deep in your soil profile. Bed two, legumes. 
These are your peas and your beans. This amazing group of plants grabs nitrogen from the atmosphere and fixes it on nodules on their roots. So I always follow up a crop of legumes with a heavy feeder like brassicas or leafy greens that really benefit from that nitrogen hit. Now I've got two types of peas to plant today, climbers and bush. So I've prepared the ground in exactly the same way. A bit of lime and then bucket loads of compost. Large seeds like peas are very attractive to rodents and birds. The rule of thumb is go twice as deep as the seed is big, but I like to go a little bit deeper, up to the second knuckle of my finger. Bed three, leaves. That's things like spinach, silver beet, your brassicas, and of course, lettuce. And in this bed, I'm gonna plant some kale and some lettuce. Bearing in mind that brassicas, like kale, are heavy feeders. So it's good to follow your legume crop that fixes nitrogen into the soil with a heavy crop like your brassicas. I like to use lettuce followed up after a root crop, like potatoes that break up that heavy soil and the fibrous roots of the lettuce help to break it up that little bit more. Because it's a hot day and they're seedlings, I'm keeping them wet as I go. Now lastly, the fruiting bed. Because I'm in a cool climate, and a lot of our crops like tomatoes, capsicum, zucchini and pumpkin are all finishing up for the season, I'm going to take this opportunity to plant a green manure crop. This is a crop usually made up of legumes that you put in the ground and then dig back through to improve your soil. This means that next season when I come along to plant my fruiting crop, they'll go gangbusters with all the goodness in the soil. Now because this basically looks like bird feed, I like to go through and get a bit of compost and just sprinkle over the top just to cover it up and this will stop the blackbirds and any other ground feeding birds from hopefully digging them up and eating them. Crop rotation should be coupled with good observation. You should be reacting to what's going on in your garden and your plan should be flexible enough to suit your situation. Figure out what crops you want to grow group those crops and then make sure that you don't plant them in the same soil season after season or year after year. Practicing crop rotation will make your gardening easier and more successful. Best of luck and I'll see you next time. Chefs love to use them so you've probably eaten them. They're microgreens. And what are microgreens? Well, they're simply green leafy herbs or vegetables that you harvest when they're really young. And it's the leaves that you use. Here's pak choy, all packed in together. Lovely celery. It looks like a little garden in itself, a miniature, doesn't it? And then that's the red mustard. Now, all of these are ready for picking. Just get some scissors, trim them off and then use them on a plate as a garnish and they're really easy to grow. All you need is a pot or a seed tray and you fill it with some seed raising mix and sow the seed. At one end of the tray I'm going to sow some silver beet and on the other end I'll put in some red kale. Sow them very thickly and tamp them down just so that they're making good contact with that seed raising mix. And then cover them up just with a light sifting of compost. Use a light spray to keep them moist and keep them moist at all times. They'll grow in a nice sunny spot on a windowsill if you're growing them in a pot, but to grow them like that is so much cheaper than if you buy them store-bought. So, why not grow some microgreens? Easy peasy. While we're all thinking about our own backyards, it's also important we don't lose sight of the bigger backyard, the natural environment and our impact upon it. A few years ago, Jerry found a project that's literally creating new inroads making it possible for wild animals to cross a busy street. Leading the project is our friend and ecologist, Daryl Jones, who you may recall from our bird story last week. This 
park is part of a wildlife corridor 60 kilometers long, but there used to be a problem. This main road cuts right through it. The solution? Build a bridge. This is a bridge, but built for wildlife. They can cross the road safely, but cars can travel underneath and everybody's safe. Professor Darrell Jones and his team chose the plants used on the bridge and have studied the wildlife here for more than a decade. So all of these plants, all everything you can see here was planted in initially and intentionally so that the animals would be attracted to this little hill. Well, all of the species around us match those growing in the forest and the transition is seamless. Absolutely, that was intentional. We wanted this artificial hill full of vegetation to be completely the same as on the stuff on the other side, so the animals will just move up and not even realise that they're on anything unusual. Well, one of the things that gardeners probably wouldn't realise is that small birds like uh, fairy wrens mm -hmm. crossing 100 metres of lawn is too much for them, let alone a busy road like this. Absolutely. So if the, the distance between the forest on either side is really massive. Lots and lots of small birds, which would never, ever cross that road, now cross here on a daily basis. It's fantastic. Things like fairy wrens, finches, silver eyes, robins, all those sorts of birds come across all the time. So what are the most important plant species growing here? Well, it'd be the calistamins and the wattles to start with. They were the fastest growing early plants and they provided the structure and the, the, the cover for the little birds and things to, to be able to hide in. And eventually those wattles died. They, they just fell over and died. People might have been worried about that, but that's fantastic for our perspective. It's, it's contributing to the, um, the breakdown of the leaf litter. Um, it's structurally diverse. It's lots of animals and lizards and all sorts of stuff live inside it, so it's, it's habitat as well. What about these poles? When this originally was constructed, it was just a bare dirt hill with nothing on, nothing on it growing it at all. What we really wanted was the squirrel gliders, which live in quite good numbers on either side of the road, to cross. But they're never going to cross an open bare patch. So what we wanted to happen was that these poles would encourage the, the gliders from, to, to glide from pole to pole to pole across. And, and they took a while to work it out. It took them about two years. But after that, they had it totally down pat and they would just cross every night. What happened though, we also planted at the time grey gums, these grey gums which are nearby, and they're the tallest trees growing on the, on the structure here, and they have now grown sufficiently. They're much higher than the, the, uh, the, the glider poles, and so the glider poles are now redundant. The gliders glide as they should from tree to tree, completely missing the poles. Now, in terms of use, how well used is this bridge by the animals? Extraordinarily well used. You've got to remember that this was a completely artificial structure. There was a lot of disturbance and dust and all sorts of stuff. And I tried to convince the people that funded this, it might take years for the animals to get used to it. But they started using it almost, almost immediately. There are also three rope ladders connecting the canopy from one side to the other, and that means that the possums don't need to go to the ground at all, so they can cross as well. What you can't see are two underpasses, especially built for, for things like lizards and frogs and that sort of thing, and they are underneath the road. In every case, these strange new artificial, sometimes concrete structures were used almost immediately. To us, it, it, it told us the animals really did want to cross and gave them opportunity, and they did, in, in huge numbers. So this is a nice place for animals to cross, but it's also a safe place. Absolutely, though the animals simply can't get onto the road here. We've got very, very specially designed exclusion fences, which means they can't get endangered on the road, and so this is the only place they can cross. So I think we can fairly say this is a success. I would say it's a spectacular success, to the extent where we're building another one at the other end of Carrawatha Forest, which is just further down, this one worked really well, now, the, now we want to build another one. Still to come on Gardening Australia, Jane has a planty little project to get the whole household growing. Millie visits a tiny inner city garden with some even tinier helpers. And we sink deeply into one artist's love affair with her garden.
now let's head back to Sophie, who's on an organic farm that grows plants for skincare products. For farm manager and agricultural scientist Nikita Sukov, the work here is a world away from what he's used to. I used to work with some uh, olives in Israel and then uh, turf production in Canada. And I did some work with uh, sugarcane in Queensland. So sugarcane is a, um, an industry that uses quite a few chemicals. This is an organic biodynamic farm. That's a bit of a contrast. Oh, I totally agree with you and it was a welcome change for me. For example, with weeds, how do you manage weeds on a scale like this? So weeds are actually our major cost in uh, the operation here. The vast majority is done by hand weeding. We also have some solarization trials. Mm -hmm. um, we also try to use some mulch. Yep. Just uh, putting some hay in between the plants, try to keep the weeds down. And what about pests and disease problems? Use companion planting. Wonderful. As well as some organic products. How many different crops are you growing? I mean, I saw roses and chamomile and... We grow around 30 different crops on the farm. Wow. Ranges from perennial to annuals, and some of them are root crops, mm -hmm. and some of them are trees. All the weeding can't be much fun for the workers here, but picking the chamomile with ladybirds for company looks like a great gig. And here you're harvesting chamomile. Now, chamomile is a, you know, not only pretty, but it obviously has herbal properties. Do you like to harvest it? I do, yeah. It's very relaxing. Oh, I love being in the outdoors and the lovely fragrances and the ladybirds, like you said. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what's your favourite crop to harvest? Uh, the roses. Yeah, definitely the beautiful colours and the scents. And each colour has a different fragrance. So obviously the roses have to be harvested at the right time to get the right oils and perfume? That's correct. Uh, we're trying to harvest them in the morning hours. Yep. And uh, this gives us the best uh, oil content of the petals. And what different varieties are you growing? I can see lots of different colours. Definitely. So roses, I think, it's one of the most popular products of Jolik. Mm -hmm. uh, we are approaching almost 3,000 uh, bushes at the moment. Wow. And uh, about uh, nine different varieties. The vast majority currently is uh, David Austin roses, the Gallica roses. And how do you manage things like aphids on your roses? I mean, I see yarrow there. Is that planted here for a purpose? That's right. We planted some yarrow crop right near the roses as a companion plant. We had some uh, aphid infestation a few weeks ago, but the ladybugs uh, that living in the yarrow came back quickly and attacked them. Uh, same with hoverflies and uh, some parasitic wasps, so it's in purpose here. Fabulous. Now, I know one of the engine rooms of this farm is the compost making. Do you use yarrow for the compost? It's part of the biodynamic preparation. Mm -hmm. We produce around uh, 200 tonnes of compost every year. Oh. And uh, it's, you're right, it's the engine of the operation. It's the nutrient supplies for the plants. And in case you're wondering, all the scarecrows are for deer and kangaroos. These elderberries are looking fabulous. How many have you got? Uh, around the 100 trees. OK, now they're really tough, hardy plants. But tell me, what's that ring around the base for? When you grow in elders, one of the trickiest part is to keep the weeds below them, and uh, sometimes we need to reduce damage caused by whippersnipper. Okay. This is why we put some tree guards. OK, that makes sense. Now, over there is the most beautiful grove of birches. Sophie, I love this area of the, of the farm. It reminds me a bit of my home country in Russia, in the Northern Hemisphere. It's also constantly shady here. Uh, which is uh, makes uh, nice to work around. We use the birch for its leaves uh, mm -hmm. f and uh, for its anti-aging properties for the skin. And so what do you do once you harvest all this material, whether elderflowers or the birch leaves? From here, uh, it goes to our drying shed. And what happens there? It's dried and stored or...? We dry it and uh, we vacuum seal it and it's stored for the next three years. Now this rosemary is loving it up here. Oh, I love this part of the farm, Sophie. The rosemary is really flourishing in this Mediterranean climate. The smell and just the views of these beautiful Adelaide Hills, it's fantastic. 
It's fabulous to see this broad scale commercial farm operating organically, but I know that's a lot of work. Is it worth it? Yes, organic uh, farmers face many challenges, but I think it's, it's worth it. Uh, first of all, we produce really good quality herbs that uh, after all goes to our skin and we deserve the best. And um, I do believe that we need to leave the the land as much um, not polluted for the all the generation that will come af after us. And uh, organic farming is the way to go. Now, if you've felt a little housebound of late, we've got a great little project to increase your houseplant collection. And the whole family can get involved. Over to you, Jane. I'm doing something creative here. Hi there. It's called Kokodama, and it's a Japanese idea. It's sort of a mixture of bonsai and hanging baskets, and it looks really good. Perfect for small spaces like verandas or a patio or even suits a larger garden. It is a Japanese term, and it means moss pot. There's the moss, and that's forming a pot. Inside is the medium. You've got a plant growing out of it, and then you hang them up. The moss is a perfect idea to make it look just compact and neat, but you can use hessian, which is a great idea, or even melaleuca bark. Paper bark works very well too. And you can see they're an organic way of growing a plant. So how do you go about making this kokodama? First, choose your plant. And this is a beauty because it's mondo grass. And out of a big clump like that, you really pull it apart and just get two or three little bits like that. Now, mondo grass is really good because it's tough and it can live in semi-shaded spots too. And I'm going to hang this in a fernery so it'll be perfect. Trim off the roots because there was just too many. They were a little bit chaotic. And then dunk them into a dilute solution of seaweed just to get over that transplant stress and to encourage new root growth. Next, I'm mixing equal parts of bonsai mix and clay soil from the garden. The clay will help retain the moisture, and you use three cups of each. And then you add water till you get a nice sticky mix. It's just got to be sticky enough so that it all holds together. I've got two circles of hessian, about 25 centimetres in diameter. That's going to form the basis of the pot. But first, I just need to cut some slits into that hessian. Just a couple of them. Just so it's easier to tie the whole thing up around the clay ball. Next, I take that little bit of mondo grass and I get a great big wad of clay and wrap it around the roots. Just keep going till all of those roots are encased in this glorious sticky mud. Now the next bit is a little bit fiddly. Just put the ball of clay onto the hessian and wrap the hessian around, but clean hands first. Ooh, this does remind me of wrapping up a plum pudding. Right, once you've done that, you need to tie it up with some twine. You need a fairly lengthy bit of twine and double it over. That's going to be what you hang it from eventually. So keep that aside and just start tying it up all around. Really quite tight. And when it's tight, just snip it off and then tie it up to the tail that you had before. Now give it a thorough soak. After a minute or so, it's ready to hang. Mist your kokodama a few times a week to increase humidity. And when it feels light, you know it needs to be watered. And to do that, just give it a soak. 
because the kokodama are just like hanging baskets swinging in the wind, make sure you choose tough plants. That's why the mini mondo grass does work very well. Now these things are really flavour of the month. The kokodama are quite trendy and you can pay quite a bit for them. But if you make one yourself, you'll find they're quite cheap and you'll get a lot of fun out of it. Most of us are gardening in a limited urban space, but that doesn't have to reduce productivity. A few years ago, Millie visited an incredible little patch that's dealing with some of the common problems faced by city gardeners. Some of the solutions are unexpected and next level cute, to say the least. Today, I'm in Northcote. This is typical inner city Melbourne, which means compact blocks with little room for a garden. But did you know that a small garden can still be abundant? Today, I'm gonna to introduce you to a gardener who knows all the tricks for getting the most out of a space. This little garden belongs to Kat Lavers. Kat is a permaculture designer and educator, and she's been cultivating this pocket-sized patch for the last 10 years. Kat, how big is this garden? The whole block is a 14th of an acre, or 280 square metres, but the area that we're standing in where most of the food is coming from is around 12 by 8 metres. This is an amazingly abundant little garden. What, what was here when you first started? Oh, it was a really typical suburban garden, a rundown house, a garden that was overgrown, there was a lawn that was barely alive, and really, really poor quality soil. You tested the soil when you got here? Yeah, we tested it for lead and found that we did have a lead contamination problem, which is common throughout most areas where humans have settled. So how did you go about designing a garden full of food on contaminated soil? Well, one of the most important steps that we've done is use the raised vegetable beds. Yep. Obviously, when we're eating that much produce, it's really important. So we have clean soil that has been brought in for those. Uh, we also know that lead doesn't generally transfer into fruits. So this beautiful blood plum behind us is totally safe to eat from. Cat rotates crops across three main garden beds, which have been carefully designed. To make things easy, they're the same size, just over a metre by three metres, which means she can rotate crops and easily move infrastructure, like the trellis system, from bed to bed. The beds that are the same size are quite an important step for us as really um, productive food gardeners. We have a planting design and I found initially when I had beds of different shapes and sizes, it was so complicated working out how many of what plant to fit in what position yeah. in the bed the next year. Yeah. Uh, these days we have more like a script for planting. We know how many tomatoes we need, we know where we're going to put them in the bed. Next year we just pick the trellis up and we move it to the bed over and then we start the process again. What were the first things you put in the ground? The trees went in um, pretty soon. And it doesn't look like you're afraid of secateurs when it comes to your fruit trees. No, that's right. They do need to be quite tightly pruned to fit in a garden like this. Uh, in a small garden where you're producing for a kitchen, it's really important that we have fruit uh, ripening all year round, what, rather than one big tree that crops all at once. Uh, so we keep our fruit trees deliberately pruned quite small so that we can have more diversity of fruit throughout the year. Kat, you're a big believer in the easy plants, aren't you? I sure am, Millie. So one of my favourites is the wild rocket. Uh, wild rocket, which is a different variety to the standard rocket seed that's usually offered to gardeners. This variety is perennial and it's also self-seeding. In fact, in some areas it's a weed, which is important that people know. This is an incredible plant for home food gardeners that's drought hardy, crops nearly all year round. And you can even cut it to the ground and it will keep reshooting for several years. We actually do a lot of chop and drop here, so we don't haul a lot of material away to a compost. We don't even have room for a larger compost system here. So much of the composting actually happens in situ, just by chopping the branches and leaving them on the ground underneath the plant. So every productive garden has a couple of chooks, right? In Kat's case, she's had to think small and her flock of quails have proven a fantastic alternative for a small space garden. 
So how did you get the idea to keep quail? Yeah, well, this is a really small urban block and so space is always going to be a constraint for us, but particularly because we've had leaded soil contamination issues and we needed to make sure that we didn't have birds free ranging in the existing soil. So the area that we're sitting on at the moment has got a concrete base and it's also got laser light above us, so it's stopping flaking paint coming from the neighbour's roof from above and it's stopping the quails getting into the original soil below. So this is just like a deep litter of mulch or something? Exactly, that's right. It's actually a compost system in progress that we're on at the moment and the beauty of the deep litter system is that we never have to clean out this run ever. We just harvest it as compost for the veggie patch after the um, materials have broken down. Uh, it's also really fantastic for the birds. As you can see, they're really interested in the litter. Uh, a quail's reason to get up in the morning is to scratch around looking for bugs. And particularly for animals that are kept in small urban areas, it's really essential for their health that they're in a stimulating environment um, that also you know, engages them in a way that allows them to be quails. So you're giving them lots of greens to eat and, and other, other things in the environment? Yeah, that's right. So um, we give them a basic uh, chook layer pellet as a ration, but we try really hard to get them away from that as much as possible. So we give them lots of greens and um, weeds from our garden. We harvest earwigs for them. We give them worms from time to time. Uh, so yeah, as many live, healthy foods that we can produce ourselves as possible. And, and the odd bath. Uh, that's right. The dust baths are really important. They love it, of course. So and it's really important that the animals um, uh, have as little stress as possible and you can see how much they enjoy dust bathing. Uh, it's also really um, healthy for them. Dust bathing is a way that birds uh, reduce lice and mites. And so it's a good preventative health measure that's really easy for us to take. And what about the eggs? Are they as delicious as a chicken's egg? Yeah, well, I've got some of the eggs here, Millie. Oh, wow. um, so the eggs are beautiful. They, I think, you know, they taste almost identical to a chicken egg. You need about four or five of them uh, to equal the volume. Yep. And um, one of the amazing things about the eggs is that each quail hen has got her own unique shape and size and pattern. So if I take um, these two eggs, you can see they were probably laid by different hens, but if I took those ones, you could see the, the matching patterns there. Wow. So that could be from the same hen. They are absolutely beautiful and, um, I mean, an amazingly productive use of this little space. A small space isn't a barrier to a great garden, but this one also shows that if you work out what you've got to work with and then apply some clever design, you can also have one that is diverse and beautiful and efficient and productive that makes use of every inch. There are so many ideas to inspire your place here. I bet this one's got you thinking. When I landscaped this part of my garden three years ago, I planted three of these, Eucalyptus caesia. One blew over in the first year in a storm. And the third one, which was here and filling out this space beautifully, blew over in another storm just recently. I was absolutely devastated, but it's given me a chance to plant something new, which is going to be this, a grafted dwarf Carimbia ficofolia. And it's going right here. I'm digging a hole just bigger than the root ball, which is fine for sandy soil, but in heavier soil, it's a good idea to make it a little wider to help with early root development. The two seasies blew over because of poor root development. They were advanced trees, 90 litre bags, which are big root balls. Now, the way they're grown in the nursery is they start off as plugs or tubes and they're potted on in stages. At any point, if the main roots get twisted up, they can girdle. And it's often hard to tell with a root ball like this. And all you're seeing is these little root hairs here in the fibrous roots, but the main roots underneath can be bound up. So one way to reduce the chance of this happening is planting smaller stock. Now in this case, I've chosen a 30 litre tree and hopefully it'll establish into a much stronger plant. You'll notice that the top of the root ball is flush with the surrounding soil. This is important. Next, I'm backfilling 
and washing the soil in to make sure there are no air pockets. To aid deep watering, I'm creating a bund around the base of the tree to direct water to the roots. Last up, some native fertiliser and mulch. There we go, looking good. Now this variety of dwarf carimbia is called baby crimson and it will grow to about three metres in height with a spread of about three metres. So its canopy will fill this space really nicely. And as the name suggests, it has crimson flowers, which look great against this pale coloured wall. So what are the take home messages here? Firstly, if you do lose a tree, it's not the end of the world. It'll give you a chance to try something different. But also, when choosing and planting trees, typically smaller trees will grow into stronger specimens. But if you want instant impact and you want to choose an advanced tree, it's a good idea to go to an accredited nursery to get the best chance of quality stock. What are some of the words that come to mind when you talk about your garden? Compost, seeds, more time please. Well, what about love? If you, like me, are in love with your garden, this next story will steal your heart. We live in Hillsville in the Yarra Valley in Victoria. It's a beautiful region. We bought a little two-bedroom house 10, nearly 11 years ago, which is one-third of an acre. And when we bought it, we were really excited about the opportunity the backyard especially had. It was a, an empty canvas for us to start playing and building a garden and growing a family. I'm Claire James, and I'm a painter and a sculptor, and this is my garden. Trying to imagine myself without a garden, and I know that millions of people, possibly billions of people in the world live without having space to garden. I just can't imagine what my mental health would be like. The need to dig in soil is so primal to me. We do all of our gardening together, the two of us. All of those naughty worms, she's a worm destroyer. My connection with animals is so deep that they give me so much just by letting me be around them to look after them. Mark and I met um, about 12, 12, no. 15 years ago. 15? Yeah. 15 years ago, some dear friends of ours, we all went on a camping trip and that was when we fell for one another. Some of the best moments that Claire and I had have had in our relationship have been in the garden. It was something that united us in terms of our shared passion for doing this kind of stuff. In many ways, it represents some of the key moments of our lives. You know, we got married here, our children are out here, they were born in the house just, you know, overlooking the garden as well. And it also represents things that we find important in life as well, whether it's being outdoors as much as possible or growing our own food as much as possible or beauty and art and creativity as well. So it kind of is the platform that sort of unites us in a way. I'm lucky enough to get to work from home. Um, so I have my art studio in the backyard. So I walk from the house to the studio each day we decided to fix up the old garden shed and make it suitable for my art practice. I paint a lot, I love watercolour painting, but I've moved a lot more into making things, so sculptural things, both small indoor pieces, but more and more larger scale outdoor pieces. And everything I make is, has a direct um, connection with something I'm fascinated with or care deeply about in nature or in the world. A 
few years ago, I was feeling quite anxious about the state of the world and I was feeling very stuck and feeling like I was only adding to the problems in the world. And I had this um, desire to sort of run away and to go and you know, either try to be in the wild and just sit in, in a wild place or do something that I could physically put myself in the environment where I felt like I could either connect deeper or make a difference. I decided for the whole month of March that I would sleep in the backyard. The real thing that stuck with me is, oh my God, I've been missing so much. Like I have been missing so much night sky. It really changed my way of seeing an, the nighttime garden and every night before I go to bed, I come out with my torch. The tiger slugs were fascinating to me. They came out every night and these beautiful lines that they were leaving, like silver, silver drawings. I made a series of very lifelike sculptures of, of slugs out of uh, modelling clay and, and painted them in detail and lacquered them so they're shiny. I found out the collective noun for a group of slugs was a cornucopia. And I thought this beautiful idea for me of a silent migration or a silent movement that, that is happening every, every night in, in every backyard, uh, it was a celebration of that. So I think I made 204 in the end, but I made this cornucopia of slugs. I spend my life in this garden working and playing, yet every day trying to find, notice something that I've never noticed before is a really nice way of slowing down and just looking deeper at things or looking at things in a different way that, I don't know, you, you end up discovering so much more about an environment by taking the time to notice. The girls so often will say, I love our garden so much. I love our garden. So maybe because we say it so much, but we really do love our garden. It's, you know, it's, it's perfect for us. <laughs>